Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Today we resume a vital conversation launched with John Palfrey, inaugural chair of the Digital Public Library of America, now with its founding executive director, Dan Cohen, formerly leader of George Mason University's Center for History and New Media. A one-stop portal for primary sources from the nation's archives, libraries, and museums, DPLA is a public option to access the full breadth of human expression. Just this year, the New York Public Library released more than 180,000 photographs, postcards, maps, and other public domain items from its special collections, adding to the DPLA's 10 million aggregated items. Nevertheless, the challenge to establish rules for orphan documents whose rights are untraceable is a barrier to full-scale digitization of the American cultural heritage. The incredible public commons from the past several millennia is weakened, the library contends, by a lack of common agreement over rights statements on these items. It continues, because of inconsistent international copyright law, risk aversion among many nonprofit institutions, and the gray area of unclear ownership that many scanned materials fall into, these collections have too wide a variety of rights assigned to them and no clear pathway toward maximal openness. This may answer a question I've long pondered, why the open source free encyclopedia of Wikipedia has not, at least not yet, converted each post into a more millennial-friendly, visual-guided exhibition derived from its sources. And I thought, Dan, we would start on that note such a great uh, prompt to talk about Wikipedia first because really what the Digital Public Library of America wants to do is to be a Wikipedia, a free resource uh, at scale, but drawn from America's libraries, archives, and museums, these institutions that have been around for hundreds of years and that really are in the business, like Wikipedia, of making materials available to everyone for free. And so we're really a perfect partner, if you think about it, to provide, in a sense, the primary resources, the materials that are in these great cultural heritage institutions uh, available. And there, so much of it is indeed visual, right, and can complement the text that is on Wikipedia. It includes photographs, a million and a half photographs from our nation's libraries and archives. It includes artworks from our museums. It includes primary sources that include video and audio. We just brought online materials around the civil rights movement and some of the video from the public television station in Atlanta, Georgia during the 60s. So all this is incredibly rich and we think an incredible complement to what uh, the Wikipedians are doing in terms of making uh, the past understandable and uh, freely accessible to everyone. We had Sue Gardner here who told us about the long journey to being the verifiable and verified yeah. source of information that Wikipedia right. has, has become. Sure. Our mutual friend John <laughs> Palfrey has talked as an ad nauseum about this, yeah. how Wikipedia evolved into a reliable, the most reliable yeah. source of information on the web. So to go back to that opening prompt, Dan, what do you think explains yeah. um, in terms of rights <clears throat> and the legality around rights, yeah. the unwillingness um, or at least the, in the inability to transform Wikipedia into 
what you're trying to create sure. now, which is a document primary source based right. um, operation. Yeah, so you mentioned rights, and we did an assessment of the rights statements that are assigned to materials that are digitized uh, at our contributing institutions. So you mentioned we have well over 10 million items from 1,800 different uh, institutions in the United States. Uh, we bring it all together at dp.la, and we've done that uh, on our website and also through our platform, our digital platform, in a way that makes it broadly accessible. But when we looked actually at the right statements that were assigned to those items, what we found is that there are tens of thousands of different statements, and you bring up the kind of friction or problems with making these items in a sense reusable in contexts like Wikipedia. And the problem is that the general public, Wikipedians, uh, everyone really is quite unsure what they can do with these items. They're thrilled that our institutions, our libraries, archives, and museums are in fact spending time and, and funds to bring this material online. But because of the complexity of rights around these items, they're really not sure what they can do. And so we are doing an international project, um, in fact, with partners in Europe uh, and other uh, countries around the world uh, to, in fact, streamline these rights. Uh, the Knight Foundation has funded a project where we are, in fact, coming up with a much smaller set of rights than tens of thousands. We're going to streamline it down to about 20. And those 20 rights statements will, in fact, for the first time, declare internationally how everyone can use every item in the DPLA. And it means that once we have that in place, I think everyone will be able to much more securely understand um, you know, what they can take and reuse in a, in a context like Wikipedia, use it in a school report, use it in a book. Um, this clarification of rights is really essential, I think, going forward to the overall landscape for learning and research. Will corporate America and the international community respect the convention mm. that you establish? Right. Well, we hope so. And, and I should point out that these are right statements, not legal documents, right? And I think you, you mentioned orphan works, which I think comes up a lot in this context. We have materials that are very clearly public domain. So all books published before 1923 in the United States are in the public domain. We provide access to a couple million of them through our site, as well as about a half a million books from the past century um, that are properly tagged, so you can understand what you can do with them. But there's a lot of materials actually between, say, 1923 and the present where the rights are just simply unclear. We have lost uh, contact with the creator of the, the resource. Um, we, the institution that is maybe holding it and wants to digitize it is unclear uh, what to do with it and whether they'll be sued. And so there's a great, I think as you mentioned, risk aversion out there in institutions like libraries, archives, and museums. And we want to work with them. I mean, we are a national nonprofit that really is working to maximize access. And a real part of that is to clarify what best practices would be around these kind of materials that are in a gray area where we're just unsure. Um, and so the right statements will include, uh, in a sense, clear statements about materials in this gray area to say that we think there are no known rights, we think that the rights have likely expired, um, but you may wish to contact the institution or you should only use this in educational context or non-commercial context. So there'll be very clear sort of tags for each item and I think that will make it a lot easier for everyone. We're working uh, as well with Creative Commons, which is part of this rights work. And I think Creative Commons has done a great job on this very topic for the, the modern day, right? If I'm an author, I, I've written a few books, um, and one of them is actually published under a CC BY license, a Creative Commons BY license, which means people can reproduce it as long as they credit me as an author. And I think that um, for contemporary materials, Creative Commons is a great way forward to clarify rights. What we're trying to do, and I think a good way to understand it, is in a sense, Creative Commons-like write statements for everything else, going back hundreds and indeed thousands of years to specify the way in which people can use these wonderful, rich materials. I'd encourage our viewers to go to the Open Mind Archive and yeah. view a program with Robert Darton, the yeah. Harvard librarian, emeritus. Google passed on this concept, right? The, the history of the digital public library is that uh, the resources were going to be availed to Google, but Google wanted a set of 
stipulations mm -hmm. that were not consistent with the values that the DPLA mm -hmm. wants to perpetuate as it relates to these rights and, and to access. Right. How, has, how has your aspiration for libraries, yeah. how, how has that objective of libraries for all sure. uh, been stymied? Yeah. Right, so you know, I should say that we have materials that were digitized by Google, for instance, books that were digitized at Harvard, um, 400,000 of them um, that are made available through the DPLA. So you know, we view commercial partners like Google as, as potentially part of the solution. I, I think as an evangelist for libraries, my key point here is that I feel this is, this is our shared culture, and I feel that libraries and uh, uh, nonprofit institutions like the Digital Public Library of America really need to be the stewards for this material over the coming decades and centuries. I, I don't think that it's healthy for a society to cede that to companies that are truly innovative. I mean, Google is incredible. Amazon is amazing, and uh, my hat is off to them for everything they do in terms of uh, immense digital infrastructure and their scanning projects and the way they enable people to read on, on new devices. Um, that's all great, but I think at the end of the day, really, it, it really is incumbent upon us, I think, to have this material in public institutions and to have public institutions work together because really that's the only way that we can ensure that this material is around for the long run. I mean, libraries are in the long run business, the forever business. They're one of the few institutions we have in our society that um, you know, we dedicate funding to, to to be around for everyone. And a word that I like to use a lot is they provide democratic access. And I think that is really key. They provide access to all. Uh, Digital Public Library of America's uh, central office is actually housed within the Boston Public Library. Um, as it says over the door, every morning I go in and it says free to all uh, right above the door where I walk in. And I think you know free to all is really critical. And I think devoting resources to something like the Digital Public Library of America and our many library archive and museum partners uh, is really essential. What about those communities, scholarly and otherwise, that are not your partners yet. Yeah, sure. How are you going to get them to become your partners? Right. And, well, and what's really yes. the obstacle preventing them from being your partners? Yeah, yeah. well, we, are, we have grown extremely uh, quickly. So, uh, you know, when, when John and I, um, you know, worked to launch this in 2013, I mean, it hasn't even been three years. Um, we only had 500 contributing institutions. We've almost quadrupled that number in just two and a half years years at this point. Um, so we're, we're growing like kudzu, which is great, um, but there's a long way to go. But the way that we're doing it, which I, I think is, um, and, and John deserves a lot of credit, and uh, Maura Marks um, and others who worked uh, early on to sort of plan the DPLA, I think came up with a really great model. And that is that the central office is quite small. We're only 15 people of librarians and software developers uh, working at national scale. Uh, with a very sophisticated infrastructure. But we rely on a very webby model, a very 2016 model, which is that it's very easy actually to join DPLA. We have hubs, what we call hubs, across the country uh, that help to bring small and mid-sized institutions online. It works very much like the web, if you think about how the web is connected together first at a local level and then at a kind of regional level and then through uh, backbones, uh, in a sense, across the United States and indeed around the world. So there's many ways to hook into DPLA and to join up, and we are in the process still uh, here in our third year of, uh, in a sense, expanding that network across the United States. And it's a very exciting time. We can see really um, that we will have a national network of a true digital library of America um, in the next few years that covers every state that allows every institution that wants to contribute to join in. And that includes a, a very wide variety of institutions, independent libraries, corporate archives, publishers, encyclopedias. I mean, there's so many different kinds of institutions that really compose the DPLA. Considering that Wikipedia is the only nonprofit website to be ranked among the most trafficked yeah. yes. web destinations, would you imagine ultimately as the success story a, you call them a companion website, yes. the resources um, that you provide being uh, affixed to what has become the world's most vibrant encyclopedia today? 
I think even more expansively than that. I would love to see that, and we've spoken to Wikipedians and, and um, uh, several times, and we're working toward that. Um, and we know, for instance, that Wikipedians are, in fact, starting to use uh, DPLA material. There's actually a little widget for Wikipedia editors um, that uh, you can install uh, in your web browser. Um, it's available on our site, and a lot of Wikipedians have taken advantage of this. And when you're editing an article, it actually shows you up at the top items from DPLA that are related to the article you are currently editing. So we have this sort of cyclical process in place where uh, Wikipedians can add in DPLA material. But again, I, I think even more expansively than that. You know, we have a website at dp.la, and people can access the entire collection there. But we're completely okay. In fact, I think it would be a great win for us to be everywhere, in a sense. Um, the website's important, but we actually have about three quarters of the use of Digital Public Library of America materials happen outside of our website. And I think that's really unique. So we provide a digital platform where we can serve these items up through third-party sites uh, very seamlessly. And uh, we have something called an API or an application programming interface, which is just a fancy technical way of saying that developers of other websites, developers of apps uh, can in fact integrate DPLA at a core level into uh, their applications or their educational websites or other library websites. And people are in fact doing that. And it is not only okay, it's more than okay with us if in fact we have most of the use coming in a sense through integration rather than by directing people to our website. I think it would be a great outcome if we weren't. I'd love to be a top 10 website. That would be a great outcome as well. But it's, it's perfectly OK with us. And in fact, part of our mission that we wish to distribute this as widely as possible through these kinds of technical integrations that really provide access right where people, in fact, are looking for the material. What is the metric yeah. um, through yeah. which you're analyzing DPLA's long-term success? Sure. Yeah. Well, look, we want to have impact in, in many realms. I mean, K-12, uh, college, especially colleges that are under-resourced, like community colleges, is a particular focus of ours. Um, lifelong learning, genealogists, amateur enthusiasts. We want to reach a lot of different audiences. But I think this is a critical question. Um, we have spent a lot of time, obviously, in the last couple of years, in a sense, building up the supply of DPLA, building up the supply of rich materials from our nation's uh, cultural heritage institutions. What we're focusing on now, and it's directly related to your question, is in a sense curating these materials for kids and many others. Um, we, we know that um, uh, fewer and fewer um, students, for instance, are, are going, let's say, uh, to a Google-style search engine that shows you 10 blue links to find what they're looking for for a report or to study. Um, and they need materials, again, in the shape that they're looking for. So we've actually recently launched a part of our site dedicated to education and curation of these materials. And this includes, at this point, 60 primary source sets, sort of grab and go, in a sense, uh, off the rack sets that take the best materials from those 1,800 institutions and put it all in one place. So you don't need to look up a particular topic and sift through the giant sea of materials. You can kind of pluck the fish out of the sea that you uh, wish to, to get. And we're continuing to, in effect, uh, expand that part of our site. Um, by the summer, there'll be 100 of these primary source sets. And what we'd like to see as a kind of a sign that this is working is um, really seeing the things like that, those curated sets actually on syllabi in the classroom being used. And in fact, as soon as we launched the first 30 of those, we saw just a spike in interest in uh, DPLA. We saw uh, all this chatter on teacher and student networks about, oh, this is this great resource. So we understand that we need to do more of that. And indeed, we will be doing more of that in the near future. I'm smiling listening to you because one of the lessons that I'll always carry forward from those beginning days of Google was when a librarian suggested that you type in your search, whatever you're putting in the search engine, and then you insert site colon dot edu. Ah, yes. Right. That trick, right. which I hope is still being <laughs> taught in, yes. in high schools and middle schools and yeah. even elementary schools. I mean, for me, it was the introduction yeah. of Google was elementary school. And uh, it, it seems to me yeah. that DPLA is 
really trying to provide a fertile home yes so that if you're not going to wikipedia you're going to dpla yes and you're inserting a a, a, a search yep and you're finding raw materials yeah for document based learning right Right. You know, that was such a great hack. You know, I, I taught history for 15 years and I, I, in fact, taught the same thing to my students to restrict, restrict their search to the EDU domain uh, in the U.S. Um, DPLA is that writ large, right? You know that when you come to dp.la, you are getting materials that are trusted, that are vetted, um, that are from trustworthy institutions. Again, um, who, who wouldn't want to get materials that, that they know are verified, that have been scanned and described? by librarians, by archivists, by museum curators. Um, so it is one-stop shopping in that way. And um, we're really excited, I think, in, in effect, that we can provide so much material um, that is trustworthy. I think that's essential. And I think that um, kids um, are looking for this material. I think in the early days of the web, you know, you mentioned Wikipedia. I remember 10 years ago, my fellow historians were complaining, it's, it's unverified and, you know, who knows what this is. Um, and we're trying to direct uh, students elsewhere. Um, you know, I think a decade later, obviously, it's gotten so much better. Um, it's been fine-tuned. There are historians who help write Wikipedia articles um, now. But I, I still think that act of trying to find trustworthy materials is essential. I think kids are taught digital literacy now and uh, where to look, and we want to be one of those key trusted resources. In the few minutes we have remaining, Dan, let me just go back to that question. Sure. And let me try again. In terms of obstacles. Yes. I think your viewers, your benefactors, the people who are interested in furthering your long-term objective want to know, not to shame anybody, but in terms of this rights-based convention that you're setting up in this yeah. 2016 year, um, what what is the best possible outcome sure. in your mind that the corporate interests and the yeah. scholarly interests yeah can find a uniform consensus around sure. these orphan materials yeah. and the rights at large. Right. Um, so, you know, my feeling on this is that copyright has always been a balance, right? And I think there's a lot of people like me, right? I, I'm an author with books and I, you know, I see it from both sides. I, I want corporate interests, publishers, authors, et cetera, to feel comfortable about the state of copyright. I also want students and teachers and the general public to get maximal access. And I think there we just have to think about working together. I, I think on both sides of that aisle um, toward a kind of collaborative position to maximize access. I think clarifying rights and, and just to again to return full circle, I think just that act alone of in fact clarifying what the rights are around an object, and then to push for at least the most liberal version, of, the most liberal reading, I, I think is the best way to go, right? If there's an what, item, what do you mean the most liberal? Yeah, the, so I, I the think greatest there, movement towards democratization. Right. I, I think we all want right democratized access. I, I think it's a critical part of being a citizen in America that we have 16,000 libraries, public libraries in the U.S. that we get access to. And so I think as we move into a digital age, we also want maximal access, obviously within the bounds. We don't want to give away material that's very clearly under copyright. But I think there's a lot of material in that gray area that no longer has commercial life, that um, is in kind of a murky zone. And what I would say is I think for those materials, it makes sense to at least be liberal to a point at which um, we can say we're going to provide as much access as we can to this. I think if someone steps forward and says, hey, wait a second, that's, uh, I wrote that, please take that offline, we can do that very easily. It's actually very easy with digital materials, unlike printed materials, to in a sense remove it from the public sphere. And so I would hope to just push against that boundary a little bit because I think if we get too restrictive, right, if we're, I think, a little bit too worried about um, one side of the balance, right, then we end up being, again, risk averse and we end up being a little bit too tight fisted with what is, in fact, our shared culture. And we want to provide access to that. When you see pushback, Dan, yeah. is it pushback as a function of institutions wanting to make money from visitors sure. and those billing hours going <laughs> to the museums and archives? Yeah. 
Right. Um, so th there's maybe a little bit of that, I think, for institutions that may not want to join DPLA. They see licensing dollar signs, I suppose. But I, I would say that's relatively minimal. I think a lot of institutions, and you can see that by our growth, understand there's, there's maybe not a huge amount of revenue there. But we're perfectly okay with institutions you know, retaining that right. I think you can provide access. We, in fact, have copyrighted material on our website. Um, so people can view it online, but the institution retains the right, in fact, to make but are money. Are there any that. institutions that say to you, we don't even want to put something in, right. in full view? We have institutions that have, have not joined. Um, but to be honest, it's a, it's a very small minority. And I think once people grasp what the Digital Public Library of America is doing, what our overall mission is, they understand the ethical mission that we're involved in, um, I think that the ice melts very quickly. And we get a lot of people on board uh, understanding that they can both provide access and also retain sustainable models of funding as well. When you look at the Boston Public Library or the New York Public Library, yeah. their headquarters, uh, you see the embodiment of what you're trying to admirably yes. create online. Finally, do, do you think that there is a wrong perception that um, public libraries are somehow inferior to those of, of private institutions? I've been so lucky to be at very privileged institutions that have huge libraries and um, you know this in a sense career change for me to to lead the Digital Public Library of America I think has been um, very important and very eye-opening for me to understand uh, how big a gap there is and how important the notion of a public library is and how important it is to maintain that notion into a digital age. I think we have uh, very quickly crept into an area where um, you know, e-reading is going on, Amazon has 65% of the e-book market. Um, we're very quickly moving into a phase where um, things like public libraries um, are being challenged. And I think that we need to think very carefully about how we maintain that maximal access. I think public libraries are a critical institution and we need to think about really through institutions like the Digital Public Library of America how we maintain uh, that mission. Dan, thank you for joining me today. Great to be here. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.